Are we all megalomaniacs? There is no sharp dividing line between health and disease. One shades off into the other by imperceptible gradations. Disease grows out of health organically. There are a thousand transitions from the one to the other. A thousand fine threads link them together. And often not even the best physicians can determine where health ceases and disease begins. As Fuchsersleben says, there is no lyric leap in the epic of life nor do delusions make their entry unheralded into a well-ordered mental life. Delusions slumber in all of us and wait for their prey. The quiet, normal being is just as subject to them as the raving maniac with rolling, congested eyes. We need only open our eyes understandingly upon the bustle and tumult of life to be able to exclaim with Hans Sachs, Madness! Everywhere! Madness! Every form of insanity, one may say, has a physiological prototype. Melancholia takes for its model the little depressive attacks of everyday life. Mania has its prototype in the unrestrained enthusiasm of the baseball fan, and even the various forms of indispensable. It is this delusional greatness of the normal person which makes life tolerable under even the hardest conditions. It gives us the strength to bear all our humiliations, disappointments, failures, and the whips and scorns of time. Of course, we are very careful to conceal this delusional greatness from the rest of the world. We all have our secret chapels in which we offer daily prayers, and to which no one, not even our nearest, is permitted even to glance. In this chapel, our idol sits enthroned, the prototype of majesty, our ego, before whom we bend our knees in humble supplication. But out there, in the world without, it is different. There we play the role of the humble, respectful, subservient fellow. We swear allegiance to alien gods and mock our ego and its powers. But sometimes the delusional greatness breaks out with pathological elementary force. We ought to keep our light under a bushel, trudge along with the multitude, day in, day out. Then all would be well. But destiny must not lift us to heights where our behavior cannot escape observation and every one of our thoughts will be deduced from our actions. Success must not narcotize us to the extent of depriving us of that vestige of self-criticism which we so imperatively need in whatever situation life may place us. Success does not pacify the roaring of our megalomania. Success goads it with a thousand lashes of the whip so that it becomes restive and escapes from the security of the preserves of the soul. Is this still a healthy manifestation? Or are we already in the realm of the pathological? Is it the first delusion, or the ultimate wisdom? The delusion of greatness penetrates whole classes of humanity, infecting them like a subtle poison against which there is almost no immunity. We have only to refer to the affairs of all kinds of artists of the first, second, and third rank. The delusional greatness of the artist usually appears along with the belittling mania displayed by his confreres, his immediate competitors. The more we depreciate our fellow climbers, that is the reason why the artist, drunk with his own ego, loses the power to be just, to measure the work of others by any but an egocentric standard. Should anyone venture to show this megalomania its true image in the calm mirror of justice, he would be characterized a malicious enemy. In the struggle to maintain the hypertrophied ego consciousness, the delusion of greatness is assisted by a willing servant, the delusion of persecution. Along with the artist class, there are many other vocations which, to a certain extent, gratify the delusion of greatness. In some callings, this is a kind of idealistic compensation for the poor material returns. The megalomania of the Prussian officer, or the American professor, who are the butts of even the so-called harmless comic journals, is an example. A close second to this is the megalomania of certain exclusive student organizations, patriotic megalomania, etc. We can no longer escape a generalization. We note that delusional greatness is a compensation for some privation or hardship. This is especially illuminating with reference to that patriotic delusional greatness which has nothing whatever to do with a wholly justifiable self-consciousness. The self-consciousness of the Briton emanates from his proud history, 
and the imposing power of his nation but we note that it is especially small nations who ought in reason to be very modest who are guilty of a tremendous self-overestimation and they do not scruple to invent an illustrious past which is calculated to lend some show of historic justification for the national delusion exempla sunt odiosa this mechanism teaches us how to estimate folk psychology a people behaves like an individual so that our findings with reference to the psychology of individuals may be applied to whole races and vice versa and here we note the individual's delusional greatness invariably has one and the same root it is an overcompensation for an oppressive diminution of the ego consciousness the daily life about us offers innumerable proofs of this assertion persons particularly prone to delusional greatness are those who suffer from certain defects and who in youth had been subjected to painful derisive scornful or depreciative criticism among these we find especially the halt the lame the partly blind the stutterer the humpback the red-haired the sick etc in short persons with some stigma by the mechanism of overcompensation such individuals may manifest inordinately ambitious natures is it accidental that so many celebrated generals caesar napoleon prince eugene radetsky were of small stature was it not precisely this smallness of stature which furnished the driving power that made them great instead of looking for the essence of genius in peculiar bodily proportions which pauper finds to be in a long trunk and short legs it would prove a more gratifying task to ferret out those primary factors that have brought about an unusual expenditure of psychic energy in one particular direction a very brilliant and suggestive hypothesis advanced by dr alfred adler attempts to account for all superior human gifts as an overcompensation for some original inferiority even if this principle may not prove true in every case it can be demonstrated to have played a part in the development of many a case of superior merit in some field of mental endeavor we are all familiar with largely authentic anecdotes about distinguished scholars who have just managed to squeeze through in their final professional examinations in their case too by overcompensation a conviction of their inferiority brought about a heightened interest in their work and this interest then became permanently fixed unawares we have wandered from the delusional greatness to true greatness but who will presume to decide what is true greatness and what delusion how many discoverers and inventors were ridiculed and their imposing greatness stigmatized as delusion and how many intellectual ciphers rejoiced in the applause and the worship of their contemporaries it is this fact which encourages a megalomaniac to permit the criticism of his contemporaries to fly by him as the idle wind which he respects not if it is not true that all greatness is ignored the opposite is true every ignored person is one of the great ones at least he is so to himself delusional greatness unites both criticism and recognition in a single tremendous ego complex the roots of this delusion as of all purely psychic maladies are infantile there was a time in the lives of all of us when we were the victims of a genuinely pathological delusion of greatness in the days of our childhood we were consumed by a longing to be big at first it was only the desire to be a big man to be grown up a little later our desires fluttered across the sea of our thoughts like seagulls or flew like falcons into the unknown vast we were kings ministers of state princes ambassadors generals trapeze artists conductors firemen or even butlers and yet we are all surprised when a butler plants himself squarely before the door and assumes the easy port of a person of some standing and identifies himself with the master of the house and graciously dispenses his domestic favors are we then much better more sensible or freer from prejudice we too stand before the doors of our desires and act as if we believe that they are realities which we are obliged to guard end of chapter chapter eleven of the depths of the soul this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the depths of the soul by wilhelm steckel 
Translated by Samuel A. Tannenbaum.